you can start whenever you're ready. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula de la Calle, an interdisciplinary artist. Um, my home deals with notions of identity and borders, migration, um, nostalgia. And I'm excited to be here. I'm currently based in San Francisco, but originally from the East Coast. Dope. So we start our first, uh, our interviews with the first question, as you know, because you're a listener, which we love to have on the show. Um, are you homegrown? And if so, how does that influence your aesthetic? Yeah, I was anticipating this question. <laughs> um, and I think for me, um, as an artist who deals with like notions of home and identity and like culturally elasticity, all of that shows up in my work. Um, but I was reading Bell Hooks recently and she talks about, um, it's from Choosing the Margin and she talks about um, making art from a place of struggle. And this quote really stood out to me and it's, um, I'm located at the margins. I make a definite distinction between that marginality, which is imposed by oppressive structures and that marginality one chooses as a site of resistance, as a location of radical openness and possibility. Um, and for me, I was like, yeah, that's it <laughs> about, um, like when you make art from this place of struggle and when you make it, it's like affirming your sense of place and, um, your sense of self. So, and I see that as an act of resistance, right? So when we're making art, um, and you grow up low income or mixed status like I did, um, and those objects start to appear in my work. I do it as a way to say, like, this is valuable. This this deserves a space on those white walls. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely think my upbringing impacts my or influences my aesthetic. Dope. Beautiful. I yeah. love bell hooks. Who doesn't love bell hooks? Like, I know. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we jump, like, super into the interview about all your amazing work, um, I just want to talk to you quickly. How are you feeling? How are you coping? How are you caring for yourself during our crazy panorama pandemic <laughs> that we're living through? Yeah, I, I love to call it anything other than a pandemic, too. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard people call it like a panini. I've heard pandemonium. Uh, a panda. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like I've had waves of, um, like, the way I live my life in this time. Um, so in the beginning, I was really, there was a lot of uncertainty, and I have a, a I struggle with uncertainty a lot. Um, like I love to control things and feel like I have some kind of decision over the outcome of things. And I think that's just my, the way that my anxiety manifests itself. Um, so I was making a lot of work because I was like, this is, if I have my hands busy, my mind is busy. And um, this is how I'm focusing or trying to not focus on the pandemic. But now um, I've had waves of grief and I think, Writing is something that really helps me and keeps me grounded. I'm reading a lot more. I'm going on solo walks um, to like clear my mind, get my body moving. I've had days where I'm like, whoa, I've taken like 75 steps all day. Um, my body's not happy with me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just like finding ways to get in tune with my body and like myself, um, making a lot of food, um, I like live in like a permanent state of nostalgia sometimes. So I make a lot of Colombian food um, and recipes when I have the energy to. Amazing. That's, yeah. It's all, it all feels like it, it is all incorporated into your own artwork and your artist practice. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start talking about your art. For one, you have an amazing piece currently up in Cambridge. Um, you put it up through the Central Bid Speak Your Peace campaign curated by uh, our, our fave, Rixie. Um, and mm -hmm. like, of course, local listeners can go out and see the work in person. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the six panel piece and um, how you came about designing it? Yeah, that piece um, is, I think, one of the best things that I made in 2020, um, especially because I, it was at a time when, at least here in California, everything was closed. You couldn't go to museums, you couldn't go to galleries, you couldn't like go see art in person. Um, so to be invited to make art in like my hometown um, 
was a really beautiful moment and for people to just be able to walk by it and see it also felt um, like a necessary part of just bringing some joy. Um, mm -hmm. And the piece itself is a digital collage. Um, it's a relief print. So the text is, I carved all of that out and then like digitized it to put it on to the collage. Um, it's personal photographs, found images. And as someone who was, who my family was displaced from Cambridge, being able to like go back to Central Square where I spent so much of my time growing up, um, felt like I was almost reclaiming that space. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and making it for like my friends who are still there and their families who are getting pushed out too. Um, it was just a, I feel like my younger self would be so excited to be invited into the space of making public art, um, especially because I used to like go around and tag the streets with my sister. So mm -hmm. to be invited to do it was exciting. Awesome. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> all right, my cat likes to jump in the videos, as many of our <laughs> listeners know now. Um, so you talk a little bit, you talked a little bit about your collage piece there, but you do a lot of collage, and I love, love, love your collage work. Um, and how do you go about finding the images that you then print on fabric? Now, like you, like you were just talking about a bunch of found images. Yes, you work with paper collages as well, but when you are printing on fabric, it has to be like so intentional. It's not like these are like found images on fabric for the most part. It's like deliberate prints. Um, yeah. So how do you go about finding these images to print on fabric? And like, how do you go about um, your paper for your collage work? Yeah, so for me, I, I like to, <laughs> I used to call myself a hoarder. <laughs> But I now I'm like, no, that. I'm like an archivist, you know, like I, I see these <laughs> things as like it. artifacts, like, yeah, I'm like, let's rebrand, <laughs> um, let's like reinvent how we're calling ourselves because hoarder doesn't sound so nice, but um, it is what I do. So my phone is, I have it with me all the time. I'm constantly taking pictures or recording sounds. Um, when my family's talking and sharing stories, I'm recording them and a lot of, I like screenshot WhatsApp messages and my mom's constantly sending me things from Colombia. Um, so I just store everything mm -hmm. that I find um, and somehow cut, I do it digitally most of the time, I'll upload it onto the computer and Photoshop and cut things out. Um, and I might just take like a corner of an image or I might not take the whole, the whole photograph isn't usually used. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just me collecting a lot of things that I see and I find, um, I also find that the internet is a great place to go when you have like a thing. I one time was like, oh, I used to drink yogurt out of bags and where, what was it even called? So I mm -hmm. like went on this deep dive on the internet to find it. I ended up finding the one that I used to drink at the corner store. Um, so it's a lot of taking photographs, sounds collecting things and then sometimes just like a good google search awesome that's so like yeah. as as someone who like i explore collage as well and it's always like the whole the only way a collage we can become successful is from the pieces right like you have to yeah. have good pieces so um collecting is necessary um, to continue our discussion on collage, does your uh, collage process differ uh, from different materials, fabric versus paper? And how do you decide the compositions for your collages? Are you a shift around type person where you move your collage around a lot before you glue or sew? Or are you kind of like, I already know, it's just go with the flow? Yeah, I think for me, um, I use composition as a way to tell a story or create a narrative. So it starts with a lot of questions and it starts with me um, wondering like, if I put this image at the center, what does that tell the audience? What does that tell the viewer? What am I trying to say? Um, if I have something at a larger scale, that also sends a message. So especially when I'm playing with found images on paper, um, mm -hmm there's a lot of play involved and there's a lot of rearranging and arranging um, and sometimes like 
scratching everything off and starting over um, and being really particular about the why behind an object being there, um, especially if there's like a narrative to the piece. Um, and then with digital, or not with digital, with fabric, um, there's a digital component to it where I get to play on Photoshop and it feels a lot less, um, there's a lot less pressure to it because I can multiply an image a bunch of times and have there be repetition or um, I can play with the scale of something if it's not quite working. So there's an opportunity there to like mess up and be like, well, it's like not printed yet, so that's fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas with paper collage, it's like, well, that was the only banana that I had. <laughs> so I can't, I have to be really um, specific about why I'm using it and where and um, mm -hmm. the story it's telling. So, so um, you're also a printmaker and um, you do a lot of block printmaking. Um, so for our listeners, that's the process of carving, um, which is a very, very tedious process. Uh, <laughs> type of process. Um, as a block printer, you have a long carving process. Does this laboring process go into the meaning of your work? Because a lot of your block printing is text, which, and you do long text, like you'll do a whole I board do. with like <laughs> paragraph. And I'm like, damn, how is, how are they doing all that? That is, that would take forever. Like I, I'm a yeah. block, I'm a printmaker too. So I'm like, I feel you on how long mm -hmm. block print. And I mean, it's a laboring process. You are using your it hands. Is. It's a, your forearms are going to start hurting. Your wrists are going to start hurting. Um, but it kind of, it kind of like the blood, sweat and tears go into the work. Mm -hmm. So how does that live on through your work? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the subjects that I interrogate, especially in my printmaking work, um, require that labor right and it's like labor of the research that goes and in, that's involved in it of like prepping the print of finding the right images of um writing the text backwards right which i've made the mistake a couple of times of doing it um normally and printing the whole block and not realizing until i'm done printing um because it's an unforgiving process too like if you make the wrong mark that's yep. it like you have to work around it or it has to become part of the aesthetic mm -hmm. of the image that you're making um so for me i think the labor is something that i'm constantly thinking about because i also print on the floor um but printmaking as a process also kind of goes against this idea of urgency or immediacy or of um getting like immediate satisfaction which I think we're really used to, especially like under capitalism, we're just like, we're producing quickly and we're just expected to just like have all of this output. Um, and printmaking slows that down, right? It like reminds us um, of using our hands and using our bodies to make something. Um, so in that way, there's also a conversation about labor being had or kind of the invisible labor of making something with your hands. Awesome. So um, you're also a sculptor. Um, you work with a lot of found materials. You talked about yourself a little bit as a collector, um, but your material choices are definitely so significant to your concepts. Um, how do you collect your materials? Do the concepts from like form first or do the materials and the objects come first and you're like oh wait like this speaks to me I know what this is trying to say it just needs to be altered and done done up in a different way yeah I think it's a combination of both um but I always see the material as having its own history um and Something that I think is important for me as an artist is to make sure that I understand the history of the material that I'm using. Like, what is the history of like textiles when I use textiles? What is the history of printmaking when I'm making prints? Um, and I think the objects that I sometimes, I like to call them artifacts too, that I'm including in my work, they have their own history. Mm -hmm. um, and when people see them, they associate different things with those materials. So. Um, for example, like I'll be walking around in East Boston and like I see a bunch of satellite dishes, right? Like that says something about the neighborhood. So um, it's an artifact of the culture there. 
So for me, sometimes the object, right? Like I'll, I'll notice something and I'm like, that says something, there's a story there. Um, or I'm just collecting things that are sticking out and later the, the story, when I have them laid out in front of me, the story starts to form. Um, but because I'm always making work that falls under the umbrella of like identity, home, nostalgia, borders, um, I tend to gravitate towards materials that tell a narrative or create a narrative around that. So can we talk a little bit about your relationship to text and art? I mean, we touched on it a bit in your printmaking, but in a lot of ways it comes up in your kind of artivism that you do, whether that being through your mural work that you've done in the past or, you know, all of your amazing prints, that printmaking in itself is very much a political statement, right? It's mm -hmm. it kind of is what push democracy in this country is like the letterpress. Like we would not be yeah. where we are without that. So um, what what is your relationship to text? And um, I know you say you're a writer, so I'm sure you have a lot of writing that goes into your work, but how do you integrate the aesthetics of text into your artwork? So I, for four years in high school, I was in graphic design. I was part of the Bridge School of Technical Arts. Um, and I was convinced I was be gonna be a graphic designer. I like love typography. Um, when I went to college, all four years, I was trying my hardest to get into the um, graphic design classes. They would always book up. Cause I think people were like, oh, art, this is how you make money. Um, which was my oh, no. mentality. I was like, I can't be an artist. I, mm -hmm. I have to do something, right? Um, that'll make me some money. So graphic design felt like the right way to go. Um, so that language of typography had been something that I had studied for four years. And then I couldn't get into a graphic design class and I stopped printmaking and was like, oh, whoa, like making images. I kind of I kind of knew a little bit about the political poster history of printmaking, but not that much. Um, but because I was interested in making political art through printmaking, text was just part of that visual language. Um, and it almost didn't feel like I was making an active choice to put text in my art. It just felt like that was something that happened naturally. But I think like you said, right, um, the letterpress changed the game. We were able to, to distribute information, get knowledge, read, um, and have the masses learn. And um, it's kind of a, a very democratic way of making. So then it became an active part of my practice. I was like, I have to include text to follow that history of political poster making. And just on my own, I have more of a writing practice versus like a sketchbook practice. Mm -hmm. I don't sketch a ton um, unless I'm planning like an installation and then I'm like, okay, numbers and what do I need to do? Um, but I write a lot, a lot of poetry and my notes app is like filled with writing. And for me, the text that I use in my work, I feel like provides context um, and is able, is a way in which sometimes the images don't tell the story. The text is able to do that. Right. Yeah. So what is next for you and your work? You are uh, making so much still during this crazy time. Um, you have been uh, producing work as well as showing up, showing work in different spaces. Um, so what's next? What is next? I um, I'm hoping to get some more time in the studio to just like play. I feel like last year or 2020 was a year where I was making a lot of work um, and like almost pumping it out in a way where now I, I feel like 2021 is a nice place for me to slow down. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm working on a lot of pieces that require a lot of time, like embroidery pieces where it's like just meticulously going and going and going. Um, so I'm hoping to finish some of those but I am currently the lead artist in um, the caravan for the migrant children who are currently in detention centers um, to call to call on the Biden-Harris administration to uncage them and reunify them with their families and heal them from the trauma. And 
through that, I'm going to be putting out a call for participation. Um, so I'm going to be kind of in the behind the scenes of mm -hmm. the art making. Um, and I'm excited for that and to get artists from across the country involved in that process. Um, and yeah, I don't even know what else is coming. Um, I'm going to be in a book. Ooh. Summer's Almanac. Yeah, I have three artworks coming out in that. Um, yeah. We're excited to see that. We'll definitely keep our listeners up to date with all the fun stuff that you're up to. And um, when you do need more artists involved in that project, we'll definitely do a call out for you for sure. Yeah, um, I'll send it your way. Yeah. Um, now that you're a creative director, <laughs> you got new titles, <laughs> new titles you can use. And lastly, where can the people find you or where do you want to be found more so? Yeah. <laughs> Um, you can find me on Instagram at Paola de la Calle and um, on my website, PaolaDeLaCalle.com. I have works for Brandy. sale right now um, <laughs> nice. at Sabroso Projects. They have a works on paper sale. And then I'm also selling some work at Domingo Com. Um, and you can find those links on my Instagram. Dope. Thank you so yeah. much. We'll have all of those links in the show notes for everyone. Um, well, thank you, Paula. It's been great speaking with you. And it's like a long time coming. <laughs> I know. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, of course. Now that like the Zoom world is like a norm, it's like, of course, we're going to interview now. So easy. Well, thank you. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thanks.